fantastic to see you all here. Very warm welcome uh, to everybody, all gathered to discuss and debate the work and the influence of Andrea Dworkin. Uh, we're really delighted to welcome you to Anglia Ruskin and to the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences and hope you have a really enjoyable and productive day. And many thanks to everybody who's participating and speaking and in particular um, thanks to all who are involved in the organisation and in particular my esteemed colleague Julia Long for putting together this programme which um, promises to be fantastic. Um, I was, I've been thinking about my own first encounter <coughs> with Andrea Dawkins' work, uh, which came about in the early 80s when I started as a new philosophy student at the um, University of Warwick, which had in those days at least a reputation for being progressive. And I found by accident the work of Dworkin and Shulamith Firestone and um, Simone de Beauvoir and Angela Carter in little bookshops in Coventry. And um, I started reading all those women's press books with a little iron on them, and the Virago books with a little apple on them, and really just voraciously consuming them, and slowly realising that the various shades of feminist ideas and arguments that were expressed there powerfully articulated a real sense of disquiet that I was experiencing that all was not quite right. And it was not quite right with the philosophy syllabus, which was 100% dead white men. It was not quite right with the philosophy department staff ratio, which was two women to uh, 10 men. And unfortunately, it's not any better nowadays. It's three women to 35 men, I think. So pretty bad. Um, and more broadly, that all was not quite right with the world in general. Um, but I also realised that I'd been a bit naive to think that reason alone and the resources of Western thinking and philosophy and history would um, be able to address that feeling that things were not quite right and even deeply unjust and unfair. So I was undertaking a sort of parallel reading course um, that sometimes chimed with the things that I was reading and sometimes went quite firmly against it. And I was really grateful and I valued that alternative um, reading course um, because it threw up all sorts of problems and paradoxes that still demand our attention, not just in a purely academic way, but in every aspect of everyday life all the time. Um, nowadays, I'm very lucky to work with some of the most passionate, inspiring, funny, fearless and dedicated women that I've ever met. Some of them are here. And <laughs> um, although we don't have a consensus on feminist ideas by any means, I do think we work together in a spirit that seems to me true to those women writers that I was reading at that time. And it seems as, as important as ever to defend some really fragile spaces that intersect between the inside and the outside of the academy to encourage the expression of free debate, passionate ideas, as well as healthy critical respect for a range of perspectives that may not always chime with our own. And I'm sure that's what's going to happen today. <coughs> so I'm going to hand over to Julia to open the conference properly and just finish by repeating that we're really delighted to welcome you all today. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Alison. So I wanted, I wanted really just to begin by um, thinking about why, why I have a conference on Andrea Dworkin. Obviously, this is the 10-year anniversary of her tragically early death <coughs> at the age of 58. And I think if Andrea Dworkin was a man, there would not only be a conference, a single one-day conference to mark her death, there would be whole schools of thought, there would be conferences on a weekly basis, there would be Dworkin studies, there would be um, 
there would be men inviting other men to come and speak at their Dworkin conferences in which they would all lionise that person in the same way that she talks about men lionising pornographers such as the Marquis de Sade. So I think this is really the very least that we can do in terms of marking Andrea Dworkin's <coughs> phenomenal contribution to feminist philosophy and feminist practice. Andrea Dworkin was an absolute giant of a thinker. Her work is so profound, and I've, I think I appreciate it now in a different way, having gone back and read it in preparation of this conference than when I first encountered it when I was at university um, in the mid-80s. I think the profundity of her work, her, the depth of her understanding and her absolutely unflinching gaze turned on male, su <coughs> male supremacy and male domination. What's that weird noise? Yes. Men drilling. Men drilling. Well, there we go, men drilling. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Andrea. I need to say no more about the source of that interruption. So ten years, ten years from Andrea Dworkin's death, is there anything we can do about it? Could someone thank <coughs> Thank you. So, ten years from since her death, we are seeing relentless levels of male violence, some of which, a fraction of which, we will talk about today. And I think that even Dworkin herself would not fully have been able to anticipate the ways in which that violence is now thoroughly normalised and legitimised by a globalised <laughs> pornography industry, a globalised sex industry, which, which serves to create and perpetuate and disseminate <coughs> and use and consume narratives involving real women's bodies, involving the abuse of real women's bodies on an industrial scale that then has an effect on all of us, whether we're directly involved in the porn industry, in prostitution or not, we, um, creates those stories which then become the stories that the culture tell. And going back and reading her work on the Marquis de Sade, I'm absolutely struck by the ways in which men endlessly present themselves as victims and blame their victims, um, the women that they abuse. And we see that in um, her analysis of the life of the Marquis de Sade. And we see that now in terms of the globalised porn industry, which presents itself very much in Sardian terms as um, the voice of freedom, of free speech, and any attempt to curtail that speech is then perceived as some kind of like injustice that is, um, that is wrought upon those men who would profit from the abuse of women. So I think it is really, really important, both in terms of Dworkin herself, but also in terms of the work that she did and the work that I hope we, or most of us in this room, are doing to, um, to continue that work. Um, uh, I also wanted to say, I've got about a minute to say it, it's probably just as well because the video won't be usable by the time I finish with the, <laughs> if I really got it off my chest, but I also think it's really necessary to have this conference because I really want to raise the question as to what what in the name of all that we hold dear has happened to feminism what has happened to feminism where if you have a critique of the sex industry if you have an objection to sadomasochism if you have an objection to the perpetuation of gendered norms of masculinity and femininity you are now being dismissed as phobic this is, this, is rendering, um, this is rendering feminism, a feminist critique, the likes of what Andrew Dworkin wrote, you are, is being rendered unspeakable in institutions such as this. And I'm really, really hugely grateful and appreciative to Anglia Ruskin University that this conversation can happen here today. Because in some places there would be a boycott outside that, we, you know, that would make it very difficult. In fact, I have to say, where's Julie? Is she around? Um, yeah. um, Julie, I have to say, I'm very, very, I don't know what happened to your tweeting. I'm so disappointed we didn't have a boycott. I was, I was relying on it for the publicity. I 
didn't bother to write a press release. I thought, oh, they'll do all that for us. I've lost my edge. You've lost your edge. I tell you what, if it was happening in the place up the road, there would have been a boycott. I don't know, maybe once you get past that mill road, you know, whatever. I can only they, Yeah, they don't, they don't stretch their legs quite that, uh, quite that far. So that is a bit of a shame because, you know, never mind. I'm sure we'll, we'll create our own, um, we'll create our own uh, energy and publicity without the need for it. But, but, um, but yes, it seems to me that, that, um, that to have an analysis and an, a, a political, a serious political objection to the wrongs that are done to us are now, you know, being silenced in a way that, um, that even in Dawkins' time, I think, was quite unprecedented. So now if, you're, if you object to the sex industry, you're whorephobic. If you object to gender, you're transphobic. Um, if you object to... Um, say domasochism, BDSM, your kink shaming. So these absolutely kind of vapid and um, vacuous <laughs> objections that now stand in the place of feminist analysis. And I hope that we can do something about, um, about that today. Um, I just want to finish really quickly because I've already gone over time. I'm supposed to be saying hello, but anyway. Um, <laughs> something that to me really epitomizes what has gone so terribly wrong with um, <laughs> feminism at the moment is the fact that Julie Bindle, last, I think sometime last year or maybe earlier this year, was invited to speak at Essex University. It was Essex, I think, was it, with Jerry Barnett? Yeah. She was invited to speak with a pornographer, Jerry Barnett. Jerry Barnett has made his money out of flogging films such as Perverted Taxi, Stepdad Punishment and Prison Lesbians, to name just three of his... Um, of his uh, catalogue on his, uh, on his uh, website. Um, Julie Bindle has a lifetime of um, radical feminist activism, setting up groups such as um, Justice for Women, you know, tireless campaigning against men's violence on women. And the Feminist Society at Essex University and the LGBT Society at Essex <coughs> University saw fit to call for a boycott of that debate not because of Jerry Barnett, but because of Julie Bindle. Now that tells us all that something is very seriously wrong with what is happening in our universities at the moment. So I hope that is something that, that we can talk about. Um, so just to finish, before I hand over to, um, to Colleen to chair, um, you'll have seen on the leaflet that Andrea Dworkin, when she was asked how she'd like to be remembered, replied, in a museum where male supremacy is dead, I'd like, I'd like my work to be an anthropological artefact from an extinct primitive society. I would say we are far further away from that vision than at the time that she said that. And so I hope that this conference will just remind us what we are here to do and what I hope we are all doing, no matter how hard and no matter the struggle every day of our lives. Thank you very much. Enjoy the conference. Welcome to Andy Rustin. Um, we are starting off today with um, a talks from Professor Ray Langton from the University of Cambridge. Where are you? There, there you are. Okay, good. I know you very well. <laughs> Old friends. Um, so, um, Ray is from the other side of the town and you've crossed the Mill Road Division. Uh, she's the author of uh, Sexual Solipsism, philis Philosophical Essays on Pornography and Objectification. And she's going to talk today about pornography as the law. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for putting this conference together. I'm delighted to be here. My title is Pornography as the Law. Not pornography and the law, and what the law should be in relation to pornography, but pornography as the law. And what I was picking up on was my uh, memory that Andrea Dworkin once said, pornography is the law for women which is a very, very striking, even outrageous thing to say. What do you mean pornography is the law for women? I found out I hadn't quite remembered. I think what I remembered was, um, was Catherine McKinnon's take on what Andrea Dworkin had said. And here is what Dworkin herself actually said. When people ask me, this is from Heartbreak, quotation one, when people ask me why I'm such a hard ass on pornography, it's because pornography is the Bible of sexual abuse. It is chapter and verse. Pornography is the law on what you can do to a woman when you want to have mean fun on her body and she's no one at all. So she did say pornography is the law and she said pornography is the law on what you do to a woman. Um, now, 
I said that's a very striking, even outrageous thing to say. I think it's an important thing to say, um, even though um, there are many ways in which pornography is not like the law. I'm just going to, I'm not, since the talk is not about the way in which pornography is not like the law, I'll just mention them and set them aside. Pornography is not like the law because uh, people make a vast amount of money out of it. Uh, of course people make a vast amount of money out of the law too, but not in that way. Um, it's not like the law in that the very making of the speech is not harming people, um, whereas um, that might not be the case um, for the law. Um, there are many ways in which pornography is not like the law. The law doesn't harness and hijack sex. The law doesn't harness and hijack uh, desire uh, in ways that pornography does. There are many, many ways in which pornography is not like the law, but today I want to talk about four ways in which pornography is like the law, and in this respect, Andrea Dworkin had something very important to say. <coughs> One thing that's important, and this is just a background uh, issue, one reason why this is important is in debates about speech, very often there is an assumption that pornography is speech like any other speech, and second, that speech is people having an intelligent discussion with each other. Here is an example, uh, and it's a wonderful passage from Judge Brandeis. <coughs> It's one of the you know, very inspiring, very quotable things that Brandeis said on the topic of free speech. Uh, Brandeis uh, said uh, that, this is in 1927, to courageous, <coughs> self-reliant men with confidence in the power of free and fearless reasoning applied through the processes of popular government, no danger flowing from speech can be deemed clear and present unless the incidence of the evil apprehended is so imminent that it may befall before there is opportunity for full discussion. If there be time to expose through discussion the falsehood and fallacies, to avert the evil by the processes of education, the remedy to be applied for evil speech is more speech, not enforced silence. Evil speech was his phrase for a certain sort of politically evil speech. Um, now, that's quoted very often uh, in connection with the argument the answer to bad speech is more speech. <coughs> if someone has a bad idea, put your own good idea out there. It's a marketplace of ideas. Let's get our ideas into the marketplace and let them fight it out. And the good ones will win. This is sometimes uh, put forward as an interpretation of J.S. Mill's uh, uh, proposal about how speech works. Though Mill himself actually had a much more nuanced view. I won't go into that here. Now, to the extent that pornography works more like the law, then clearly it is not a piece of reasoned discussion. It's not it, simply the expression of an idea. And this is very much uh, a theme in Dworkin and McKinnon's work, that we ha what we have here may express ideas, of course the law itself does express ideas, uh, the, um, and apartheid law, slave law, all of these laws express ideas, but the fact that they express ideas doesn't mean that that's all they do. So I'm going to talk about the other things that they do, which make it much harder to fight bad speech with more speech. So, the four things I want to talk about are that the law has authority. The law can subordinate. The law can set norms. And by disabling the speech of some people, the law can silence. So I'll take those in turn. The law has authority. It has a very special sort of authority. I'm not going to get into how it gets its authority. Um, but it's in virtue of its authority that it can do what the law can do. Um, it, can, it has what some philosophers have called practical authority. That's the sort of authority that you have when, in virtue of your role, you can, um, you can set practical norms. Those norms might be... Um, you know, prohibitions, they might be uh, permissions, they might be uh, more than simply the setting of norms, they might also be the enactment of social standing. Um, I'm going to say something about that when I get to the subordination point. 
In addition to authority of the practical kind, there is also authority of the epistemic kind. That's when we say, so-and-so is a great expert on such and such, they have authority. Authority of an epistemic kind is different to authority of a practical kind, and the law is not normally seen as an authority of the epistemic kind. People think of it as uh, its business being to set commands. But sometimes authority of an <coughs> epistemic kind interacts with authority of a practical kind. Joseph Raz, the philosopher of law, talked about the way a doctor has epistemic authority, they know a lot about health, and in virtue of their epistemic authority, they can enact rules for their patients. They say, hmm, you know, given your condition, I, I would say that, you know, chocolate is out for the next four weeks. So that's saying, the rule for you is don't eat chocolate. Why is that the rule for you? Because I understand what's going on and you take me to have epistemic authority on that and therefore you take me to also be in a position to say what is good for me and therefore to say what I should do. So there's this connection between the expertise sort of authority and the practical sort of authority in some cases, like the case of the doctor. Now, I would want to suggest that in the case of pornography, what's going on is a mixture of epistemic and practical authority. That is to say, um, people don't tend to go to pornography simply to say, oh, I need to know what I am required to do, otherwise I will get put in jail. It's not that sort of authority. It's authority about, uh, in fact, what our teenagers say most often, why do you look at pornography is, I want to find out about sex. So it has, and this is something that uh, Jeremy Waldron has recently commented on in his book about hate speech, it has a pedagogical role which is partly connected with its, uh, it, with its authority of an epistemic kind and that is how it connects with the practical authority whereby it is able to enact uh, social status and enact norms. Now, um, they mentioned Waldron, uh, the quotation is number eight on the handout. Um, the visibly pornographic aspect of our culture has a pedagogical function that dwarfs in its scale and intensity the attitudes that hate speech tries to inculcate. Not only does pornography present itself as undermining assurance to women of equal respect and equal citizenship, he has there a point about the undermining of knowledge of equal civil standing. That's a very important point. Um, but it does so effectively by intimating that this is how men are taught around here on the streets and on the screen, if not in school, about how women are to be treated. Waldron is saying, uh, is saying Andrea Dworkin's point that pornography is the Bible for <coughs> certain people. Um, that is to say, it's treated as an expert authority which therefore um, has uh, advice, permissions, uh, as well as recommendations and even, you know, this is what you have to do. Um, so um, he doesn't actually cite Andrea Dawkins, I don't think, but he certainly cites McKinnon, who of course was working together very closely. I've been talking about pornography uh, in a general way. I haven't said anything about what I'm taking that to mean. I just want to remind you, in case reminders should be needed, that what we're actually talking about here is a specific subset of pornography as it's normally taken to be. The uh, definition, the famous definition that Dworkin and McKinnon gave, we define pornography as the graphic, sexually explicit subordination of women in pictures or words that depicts women dehumanized as sexual objects, things or commodities, enjoying pain or humiliation or rape, being tied up, cut up, or mutilated, bruised, or physically hurt. And then it goes on with some more details, which if you want to see our number three on the handout. I say that because uh, we are, are keeping in mind that the ordinance that they were recommending as a legal remedy for pornography was a civil rights ordinance that concerned a certain subset of what was normally taken to be uh, pornography. So that's a background assumption that I'm working with uh, just today. So the law can have authority. Authority is relevant, is relative to a uh, particular group. So epistemic authority, you can be an expert relative to a group even if you don't know a lot because uh, you happen to know, seem to know more than anybody else. So it's relative to a particular group and it's relative to a, diff a particular domain. You know, nobody's going to say uh, that, uh, that um, a particular 
so, sorry, I mustn't get myself, I mustn't distract myself. It's, it's, rel it's important to say you don't just answer the question, does pornography have authority in the abstract? You don't just think, hmm, are pornographers widely regarded as authority figures? No, you don't. You look at where they are being taken to have authority and whether people believe what they are saying and whether people are following their recommendations and advice. And if so, in what circles and in what context? It's a very contextual, local thing. And it's very important to realize, uh, to keep in mind this point about a pedagogical function. I only recently discovered something that some of you may know, which is that there is a, um, uh, the Children's Commissioner's report on, uh, on young people in Britain's views about sexual consent fantastic document which had something in common with Dawkins approach of actually going and asking women and also young men uh, high, of, in this case of high school age and being informed by the testimony of people um, I don't have time to read it out I've put uh, on the handout a small quotation from the Children's Commissioner's report um, which is which consists of interviews from high school kids um, about imagined situations of sexual violence. And what is very striking about them is uh, that the norms that they are taking for granted um, are the norms that uh, pornography is legitimating. And in fact, the Children's Commissioner's report talks about the influence of pornography in that report. I am talking about victim blaming, the sense that a woman who dresses that way is asking for it, and a number of other rape myths, which at a minimum are part of the concern about how sexual consent is understood. Now when you're asking what are the norms that bind the young people who are described in this report, are they the norms of the law that which state what consent requires, namely full awareness of what's going on, um, uh, no deceit, no, um, uh, no incapacity through um, drunkenness or sleep, no, the norms that are the law for young women, in the, as described in, this, in these studies, are the norms of pornography. So in that sense, uh, there's something very genuinely accurate about the thought that pornography is the law for certain young women who are made to live in a world where those are the norms. I said I was talking about authority first, and I've already got into talking about norms. That's because when you have authority, you can set norms, and you can subordinate them. Also, you can silence. I have, how many have I, uh, have I had my five minutes, Mom? Yeah, no, I've, no, I've got six minutes. I've got six minutes, okay, <laughs> gosh, okay. So, subordination, I take to be a, it, it picks up on what Dworkin said when, uh, when she said, uh, she's no one at all. That is to say, subordination is a matter of making a human being less than a full human being. That I'm taking it to have a background uh, in the idea of objectification and uh, enactment of subordinate civil status. Um, subordination, I've elsewhere argued, in, can involve, this isn't a definition, but this is sufficient for it, <laughs> ranking somebody as deeply inferior, legitimating discrimination against them, depriving them of powers and rights. The law can do all those things. Slave law does that, apartheid law does that. Ranks a group as inferior, legitimates discrimination against them, deprives them of powers and rights. Those three features can be present, uh, at least it's an empirical question, but I think it's uh, plaus plausibly answered yes. Those three features can be present in certain sorts of pornography. Ranking women as inferior, as uh, mere sex objects, legitimating discrimination against them, because let's not lose track of the fact that sexual violence is a form of discrimination. It's an offense against equality as well as safety. Okay. Um, and, uh, and depriving of powers and rights, that's going to connect with the silencing theme that I'm going to get to in just a minute. Was that my five minutes? Okay. <laughs> Subordination. Norms. The law sets norms. The law mostly is thought of as setting prescriptive norms, but there are many sorts of norms. Recommendations, advice, um, permissions. Um, against a backdrop where uh, people are, are hesitant to be violent, 
Permissions are very important. Those, of, those who have studied the training of soldiers in war know that part of the training involves uh, breaking <coughs> through the inhibitions against violence. So permissions can be a very important norm to enact. Um, now, um, one important way that norms can get enacted is not by saying, you must do this or you will go to jail. It is by putting something forward as if it is already a norm. So putting something, uh, so through an act of expert testimony, not enactment, not explicit enactment of a rule, through an act of expert testimony, uh, conveying the idea that this is already how uh, we treat so-and-sos. This is already how we treat uh, people who are such and such. This is how people already go on. Now, of course, people are really curious about sex. Why sh of course they are going to be curious about the thing that is so important to us. It's um, such a source of meaning in our lives. That um, hunger is hijacked into a uh, transformation of social norms which are not seen as a transformation formation, but merely a transmission of what everybody already believes. So this is, called, this is what uh, Dworkin and McKinnon have talked about under the idea of normalizing. So setting something forward as if it's normal is actually more potent than setting something up as a rule. Um, there's a huge literature that I find very interesting in social psychology, and you're going to be very puzzled if I'm not going to have a chance to talk about it, which I'm not. Um, Cialdini, a social psychologist, uh, has studied the way in which merely finding out that certain that uh, people are doing something is enough to make it seem more permissible and sometimes required. The funniest case is the case on the handout. Um, a petrified wood forest in Arizona, the uh, rangers put out signs saying, your heritage is being vandalized every day by theft losses of petrified wood of 14 tons a year, mostly a small piece at a time. Wherever those signs were, theft went up. <laughs> Wherever those signs were, theft went up. They were trying to ban theft and they ended up promoting it. They ended up promoting it. Why? Because the news was, the take home message was, everybody's stealing. Wow, everybody's stealing, so it's okay. And gosh, that's an idea I wouldn't have thought of before. So actually, descriptive social norms, the idea that this is what people are doing, this is what is going on, this is our practice, this is actually very often something that has more force, more normative force for us than somebody coming from the outside and saying, I am hereby going to set this rule for you. So that's a very important aspect that people lose track of. I said, uh, I'm talking about um, authority, subordination, norms. The last thing I'm going to talk about, and then I'm going to stop, is silence. So, <coughs> when people think about speech, they think about words. Pornography is mostly pictures, but it's normally treated as speech. They also think about words used in reasoned discussion. That was Brandeis. Um, We've seen that obviously in the case of the law, words are not uh, doing just that. They can be used sometimes to subordinate, sometimes to set norms and rules, also sometimes to silence. There was an Alabama state slave law. I don't remember if I put it on the handout. Yes, there's an Alabama <coughs> slave code from 1861 which said, because they are slaves, they are incapable of performing civil acts, and in reference to all such, they are things, not persons. The law is saying of certain people that they are things, not persons. That piece of law is subordinating, enacting civil standing. That piece of law is enacting rules as to how the slaves were to be treated. It is also, and I haven't included this part of the law, it was also silencing them um, by saying, um, that they couldn't um, perform certain speech acts. Uh, they weren't allowed to, sorry, it's not that they weren't allowed to, they weren't able to testify, for instance, against their masters. Um, so, um, 
Silence can be more than a matter of not being able to make a noise. Silence can be a matter of being able to say your words and not being able to do things with words. It can be a matter of being able to say your words and not being able to perform the speech act that you are meaning to perform. The speech act that most concerns me in this on this particular topic <coughs> is that of consent. That of consent, and consent itself is not enough, but let's just think about that. Um, suppose a woman says no and she is trying to uh, refuse sex. Suppose she's like the young women who are described in the Children's Commission report who are saying no, um, but something about them is being viewed as if they're saying yes. Uh, the top that she was wearing was like a sign. Uh, the boys are saying the top, it's like a sign on your head saying shag me. That's what the boy in year 11 said about the girl wearing the top. Um, so it's like, so there's something about the how to read uh, sexual behavior that is getting in the way of women's speech doing what it means to do. So silence can be a matter of disablement of your speech as well as punishment of speech. There is also, of course, punishment of speech. Um, so uh, one thing, and this is um, getting back to the not the fun kind theme. Um, one thing that's uh, one thing that matters when we're thinking about speech and whether it gets punished is that disincentives. Th there are disincentives for criticizing the law, and I'm going to finish with this last analogy. But you know, people who criticize unjust law are very often seen as heroes. Uh, they might get the uh, Nobel Prize if they're very successful at criticizing and campaigning against unjust law. Unjust social norms enacted by pornography are hard to criticize because what you're criticizing is seen as fun and as sex. So that is, the, that is the part that needs to be undone if sex and fun are actually completely different to the false image of sex and fun uh, that is being promoted as pornography's law in those circumstances. I'm out of time. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Brilliant, and you did. You managed to say such a lot in a really short time, and I didn't. I gave her a bit more time because I wanted her to wind up in her own time. So that was brilliant. Thank you. That's I have very risky. <laughs> <laughs> I have got lots of questions, but I'm sure you do. So we have ten minutes for questions. Yes. And um, there's not really a question, but more of a comment with regards to the people that were um, in the survey, the answers that were talking. Um, I find that um, there's a real lack of distinction between the sexes of the people that we're talking. Um, just with regard to the quote, the girl is, is talking with regard to females who will be between themselves, and then that there are boys who are sort of saying the same thing. I find that her position is the one of the oppressed, and his position is the one of the oppressor. And I think that there's not really much of a radical feminist understanding of the attitudes of the youngsters that they're talking to. It just seems to be very much um, sex gender neutralized in terms of their um, eliciting of the, the, the opinions of the young people. It's not really being acknowledged that this is, that they, that the, the boy is speaking from an oppressive position and, and right. the girls acquiesce in this position of the oppressed. So I, I, I completely take that point. What I was doing was, I mean, that's partly a function of my having pulled out just some quotations from this document. I think that the document as a whole is very alert to exactly the concerns that you have. That is to say, the authors are very alert. Um, but what they were concerned to do was let people, uh, let the teenagers in question, both uh, young men and young women, uh, put their views in their own words. And part of the, their concern was that this was a shared uh, set of social norms that was damaging the women 
Um, but the women themselves were sharing the, sharing the norms. That was part of the thing that they were con very concerned about. Um, so, I, so I take responsibility for, the, for that gap, but the gap is, um, I think, is in the selective way I was quoting it. So I really would encourage anyone who wants to see it to have a look at the whole report. Thanks. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Can you say who you are? Yes. Yeah, that would be good. Um, my name's Heather, Heather Runs Gull Evans, and um, I'm an academic as well at Leicester, the University of Leicester. <coughs> I really take your point about the epistemic and practical authority of pornography in terms of it presents itself as being about sex, real sex, what sex really is, and it presents itself as being fun. Now, in order to interject into that authority that it has, um, you have to redefine the terms, but it's very, very difficult to do it. Now, until we reverse that, that language is going to be very popular with people who don't quite understand what the debates are. But it's very difficult. It's like a tsunami trying to hold back that kind of language. So I was wondering whether you had not that you should have, but whether you have any suggestions as to how, other than just keep, keep repeating, I'm not anti-sex, I'm actually pro-sex mm -hmm. as an anti-pornography person. It's you guys over there who are anti-sex um, because pornography isn't actually about sex, it's about sexual violence. It's very difficult for people to hear that who are not part of the debate. They, the pornographers have won the argument by using that language, I think. Okay, so I don't think they have won the argument, but it's... Right. But I... But, you feel but, that optimism. So, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate... You know, I think this is a huge question, and I, yeah. and I can't do justice to it yeah. in the next, in the next um, minutes, but I would like to talk about that later. I completely yeah. agree uh, that, there, that there needs to be, and I think there is, a way of, of getting that message across. Right. Thanks. Mm. Interested in the overlapping of the norms and the silencing we talked about. Mm. Um, I'm aware from the debate last night where a teacher shared uh, some sexual abuse that was going on among the kids at her school, and also from um, other youngsters in Camden who are getting um, feedback about their dress, about how to dress. And what I'm interested in is in what ways are the controls over how we dress which is, I think, quite a current thing. Um, in what ways are they uh, reflecting what you're talking about with the pornographer setting norms and silencing, especially young women? I, I'm not familiar with what you're with the particular um, uh, attitude or event that you're describing, but certainly it's it's part of a it's part of uh, a situation that creates a. Uh, that creates competing norms uh, for uh, for women and and perhaps especially for young women who have the categorical imperative to dress a certain way because otherwise they're not sexy and appealing and then dress that way they are asking for for what they might or might not want um, so uh, and then you have language feeding into that too so you you have one thing that came up in this study actually was the dilemma that young women had where they were uh, forced to choose between the only two possible descriptions of their action, uh, being frigid, if they said uh, no, and being a slut, if they said yes. And so there, were, there was this sort of um, avalanche of disapprobation that fell on them, whatever they did. So it was a double bind, and the dress codes sort of feed into that in ways that I think we can see. Uh, but I think it's a very important and interesting question and I don't think I've at all done justice to it. Thank you. One more question, I've been told. One more question. One of you had your hand up before. I'm not sure which one it was. Was it you? I just wondered, there was an article very recently in The Guardian that they spoke about abusing women as non-consensual BDSM. <coughs> and I think that... Like I'm pleased to hear that you don't think the argument's lost, but I find it very um, troubling. I wonder how we deal with a society that thinks that beating women up is just a non-consensual BDSM, and that actually BDSM is the norm. So I think that the um, 
that the language that we have available to describe what we experience doesn't determine our experience, but it really seriously constrains what we can say. Um, and I certainly agree with you that that's... Um, in a situation where there is uh, so much violence against women and that the biggest problem is it being underreported, to have uh, propagation of certain um, images of violence as normalized um, makes things much more difficult um, rather than easier. So it's the last thing that we need. Yeah, so I agree. Mm. Okay, thank you very much and thank you, Christian.